Hello and welcome back to Scholastically Natalie. Uh, if you're new here, welcome. Sometimes we talk about things. If you have returned, thank you for coming back. Uh, this week I figured we could have uh, some more fun and look at the Ballad of Mulan, which I really hadn't known existed. Uh, like, I knew Mulan was kind of like a historical folklore figure in China, but I really didn't know much about her. I just knew that there were some general critiques of like the older Disney animated movie and stuff. Uh, but I didn't know there was a poem written about her. And I only found out after watching, oh my gosh, I can't pronounce her name. I'm sorry. I just, I don't want to butcher it on accident. I'll link her channel below. I was watching a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> lady uh, who was explaining cultural differences between like, you know, the animated Disney Mulan and then the 2020 live action Mulan and actual Chinese practices and beliefs. Um, she's wonderful. I love her. Her video is amazing. I've watched uh, quite a few of them by now because uh, she has exactly the right sense of humor for me. And she's so detail oriented that it just it makes my heart happy. I will try really hard to remember to link her in the description down below. Oh no, I'm yawning. I'm sorry. But if I forget, please remind me and I will add her in because she's wonderful. Okay, so. Yes, this is exactly what I just said. I always forget what I put in PowerPoints, even though I make them, like, you know, and I read them. Uh, I, it's the nerves of presenting, I guess. But yes, I, according to the internet, she is even cooler than Movie Mulan, and that's literally all I knew. Uh, so I just want to let you know that I don't know if everything I have found is fact. I don't know if everything is going to be super conducive and precisely how it's presented in China, of course, and how Chinese people may know of it. Um, this is kind of cursory surface level research. I have used Wikipedia sources. I apologize, but like, I don't know, a lot of it's just like, where is this thing located? Which I think it's okay to use Wikipedia for. <laughs> I don't think anybody's screwing with their geography that much. Um, so, I found two different versions of the Ballad of Mulan. Um, so there's one that was pretty common, like a common translation that I found on multiple websites. I used the one on Wikipedia just because it was the easiest to copy and paste. And then there was one that I found from the University of Columbia. Uh, that had a uh, more unique phrasing. I'm not sure, of course, if it just means it was translated poorly or they're from two different tr versions of it because I did hear that it got like redone a couple times throughout history. Uh, the Columbia one looks like it's more translated into like more archaic language, whereas the Wikipedia one looks to be more cleaned up to be modern. So there's going to be version one, version two. Version one is the cleaned up one from uh, Wikipedia version 2 is going to be the older one from Columbia. I figured it could be fun to read them both. Uh, the one from Columbia has some fun onomatopoeias that I like. So we are starting in version 1, found in most places. This one from Wikisource. I don't really know what differentiates Wikisource from just Wikipedia, um, but I think this one did say that they translated this one specifically. <laughs> I will try to link all of my sources in, at the very minimum a document. Oh no, I'm sorry guys. So, let's begin. So we have version one stanza one. The sound of one sigh after another as Mulan weaves at the doorway. No sound of the loom and shuttle, only that of the girl lamenting. Ask her of whom she thinks, ask her for whom she longs. There is no one I think of, there is no one I long for. Last night I saw the army notice, the Khan is calling a great draft. A dozen volumes of battle rolls, each one with my father's name. My father has no grown-up son, and I have no elder brother. I'm willing to buy a horse and saddle to go to battle in my father's place. <sighs> So I did identify some words that you just might be unfamiliar with or that you might not have good, like, pictures in your head of. So we have loom and shuttle, which of course is a weaving tool. Uh, I tried to find an older picture of ancient Chinese weaving tools, aka loom. Uh, shuttle is what you use to, like, weave the 
strands together. I don't know how to weave, I apologize. <laughs> but it's what you use to kind of like make the, move the strands around into a pattern. It's kind of like a giant needle. And then next we have Khan. Um, apparently Khan was used to refer to a ruler or military leader of Inner Asia. Um, I did think it was interesting that it was like commonly used among the Rorins. I think it's Rorins <laughs> who Mulan was thought to have fought, or at least thinks that that's what the poem is based off of that fight. So then we have the second stanza. She buys a fine steed at the East Market, a saddle and blanket at the West Market, a bridle at the South Market, and a long whip at the North Market. She takes leave of her parents at dawn, to camp beside the Yellow River at dusk. No sound of her parents hailing their girl, just the rumbling waters of the Yellow River. She leaves the Yellow River at dawn, to reach the Black Mountains by dusk. No sound of her parents hailing their girl, just the cries of barbarian cavalry in the Yan Hills, or to be Yan Hills. I think it would be young. So, one thing that I really like about this is the repetition of the last six lines of leaving to reach things, um, and the repetition of no sound of her parents hailing her, because it very obviously implies that she's missing home and is instead encountering unfamiliar sounds. So I again highlighted some places that we might not know about. So the Yellow River is the longest river in China, and it is yellow because it carries a massive amount of silt. Um, it is also known as, oh gosh, I really don't want to get this wrong, so I apologize in advance, Honghe? I think that would be how you pronounce that. And then there is also Black Mountain. Um, it was really hard to figure out what Black Mountain might be or where it is, so this entirely might be wrong. Um, so I also got results for Black Mountain Valley, so I would assume that would be the same place in Black Mountain. So I think in modern day it might be in Haitian or Hishan. I'm not sure how to say that, which translates to Black Mountain County in the northeastern corner of Jinzu City. <laughs> And then we also have the Yawn Hills, which I thought might be near the Black Mountain or that the Black Mountain might be a part of them. Um, they are also known as Yanshan and Ari Mountain Range in Heibai. I don't know if that's also how you pronounce that. Uh, I'm so sorry for any and all names that I'm butchering in this. I just realized that this is just potentially Natalie saying Chinese words very badly. So then we have stanza three. Ten thousand miles she rode in war, crossing passes and mountains as if on a wing. On the northern air comes the sentry's gong. Cold light shines on her coat of steel. The general dead after a hundred battles. The warriors return after ten years. Uh, I like the repetition of the number ten in this stanza especially. I think it's nice and kind of like a fitting motif. I love the description of cold light shining on her coat of steel and crossing passes and mountains as if on wing. They're kind of phrases that you wouldn't hear nowadays, and I just, I love hearing that kind of like older language. So we come to stanza four. They return to see the son of heaven who sits in the hall of brilliance. The rolls of merit spin a dozen times, rewards in the hundreds and thousands. The Khan asks her what she desires. I've no need for the post of a gentleman official. I ask for the swiftest horse to carry me back to my hometown. So before we move into the definitions, um, in case we've forgotten, of course things are communicated in scrolls. So in order to unroll these, this list of merits for her or potentially her and her troop, it, they have to spin it a dozen times. Which, of course, means she's highly recognized and honored. Of course, she's also been fighting for ten years. And so then we have the emperor asking her what she wants and offering to make her a member of court. And she's pretty much just like, nope, I just want to go back home. So then we have the Son of Heaven, which is, of course, the, one of the titles of the Emperor of China because of the Mandate of Heaven. The Mandate of Heaven means that, you know, their ruler is either endorsed or cursed by heaven. It's not always a natural bloodline, but that's kind of implied that it is. Um, 
So like natural disasters are divine retribution for things happening under the emperor's reign or against the emperor itself, and if they're dethroned, that is the will of heaven. Um, of course, that's, you know, history looking back retroactively, so depending, <laughs> we'll see. But often people were searching for symbols to either give credit to or discredit the emperor of China. Then we also have the Hall of Brilliance. I kind of assumed it was just like the regular palace that um, the emperor would be at, but I googled <laughs> it just in case there was a specific building. Um, and it said that the Palace of Great Brilliance is in the Forbidden City, uh, but then I, I think it could just literally mean the place where the emperor was at that time, which I don't know which capital that would be. Um, and since the Palace of Great Brilliance is currently um, known as the place where the concubines lived, I'm not sure if this is correct. I'm pretty sure it is not. This is my biggest stretch. Sorry, we paused for a refueling. And so then we have stanza five. Her parents hearing their girl returns out to the suburbs to welcome her back. Elder sister hearing her sister returns adjusts her rouge by the doorway. Little brother hearing his sister returns sharpens his knife for pigs and lamb. I open my east chamber door and sit on my west chamber bed. I take off my battle cloak and put on my old time clothes. I adjust my wispy hair at the windowsill and apply my bisque makeup by the mirror. I step out to see my comrades in arms. They are all surprised and astounded. We traveled 12 years together, yet didn't realize Mulan was a lady. So that is quite a dis difference from animated Mulan, of course, where it's maybe a year? I'm not sure they don't exactly tell us timing. Um, where they traveled for 12 years. Also, I thought, I thought the use of the word bisque um, in this was humorous because, you know, it's that weird liquidy, almost like gravy uh, consistency. Most often you would hear things it in cooking, like a lobster bisque, so I thought that was interesting. And last stanza, we have the buck bounds here and there whilst the doe has narrow eyes. But when the two rabbits run side by side, how can you tell the female from the male? And so here we last we have when two people are doing something at the same time, they are both accomplishing the same thing. What does the gender matter? Or how can you tell them apart? Which I think is a very interesting and quite feminist, honestly, <laughs> take in early China. Like, this was something that was published oodles and oodles ago. Honestly, sometimes I forget how much history that China has behind it, and then I'm just remembering that, like, while the rest of the world was just barely, like, functioning, they were over here just living their best life, honestly, with their empire. It's wild. So then we're going to do version two that I got from Columbia University as part of like, I think it's supposed to be like teaching kids to read poetry. It came with like zero instructions, which I thought was kind of funny. So we start out with stanza one. Again, onomatopoeia, in case you forget, it's words that represent sounds. So like pow and bang, um, they, they bring up a noise for you. And this has several of them, which I love. To siek, to siek, and again, to siek, to siek. Mulan weaves, facing the door. You don't hear the shuttle's sound. You only hear the daughter's sighs. They ask daughter who's in her heart. They ask daughter who's on her mind. No one is on daughter's heart. No one is on daughter's mind. Last night I saw the draft posters. The Khan is calling many troops. The army list is in twelve scrolls. On every scroll there's father's name. Father has no grown-up son. Mulan has no older brother. I want to buy a saddle and horse and serve in the army in father's place. Again, Khan is a ruler. In the east market she buys a spirited horse. In the west market she buys a saddle. In the south market she buys a bridle, in the north market she buys a long whip. 
At dawn, she takes leave of father and mother. In the evening, camps on the yellow river's bank. She doesn't hear the sound of father and mother calling. She only hears the yellow river's flowing water cry, to Sien, to Sien. I just, I love, oops, I love the onomatopoeia of this and the slightly different structure of calling people father and mother as like names and her being addressed as daughter. So it was just a brief reminder that the yellow river exists. Um, and then we have stanza three. And I like that the gap in this is meant to kind of indicate time passing. At dawn, she takes leave of the Yellow River. In the evening, she arrives at Black Mountain. She doesn't hear the sound of father and mother calling. She only hears Mount Yen's nomad horses cry to Sui to Sui. She goes 10,000 miles on the business of war. She crosses passes and mountains like flying. Northern gusts carry the rattle of army pots. Chilly light shines on iron armor. Generals die in a hundred battles. Stout soldiers return after ten years. And so what I do love is the she goes 10,000 miles on the business of war. Mostly because it kind of like brings up to mind like business trips, but uh, I don't know. That's kind of just amusing imagery for me. But I also just love the phrase the business of war. Like I think it sounds so cold, and, like uncaring. Um, and I do like the difference between the sound of army pots versus a scout's gong, um, because the two are very different, uh, sounds. <laughs> and I kind of, I kind of like that. I do, however, still prefer the earlier discussion of cold light on the coat of iron, uh, rather than this one. I feel like this could almost be turned into, like, some sort of chant with how short this, uh, the second half of this stanza is. So again, I am utterly confused about where Black Mountain is. So then we have, on her return, she sees the Son of Heaven. The Son of Heaven sits in the splendid hall. He gives out promotions in twelve ranks, and prizes of a hundred thousand and more. The Khan asks her what she desires. Mulan has no use for a minister's post. I wish to ride a swift mount to take me back to my home. And so here, I think what's interesting is that they say it takes a dozen turns um, to unroll the scroll, or at least that's what I presume from that. Here, he's giving out promotions in 12 ranks. So you're being moved up 12 slots in his court, which I think is interesting. Um, and then here, we also have a minister's post versus a... Uh, a male official's post. And so I think if you watch, uh, if you've watched Avatar, they do have a part where there's more Minister Chin. I think his name's pronounced Chin. Maybe it's Kin or Quinn. Um, but he appears to talk to the mechanist in the Air Temple, blah, blah, blah. But some officials in governments are called ministers. Uh, which I think is very interesting because it also kind of implies that they're like aligned with the church, although probably not for ancient China because I know that they call their priests something different, which I can't remember right now. <laughs> and so then, again, just a reminder of what the Son of Heaven is. So then we have stanza four. When father and mother hear daughter is coming, they go outside the wall to meet her, leaning on each other. When elder sister hears younger sister is coming, she fixes her rouge, facing the door. When little brother hears elder sister is coming, he wets the knife, quick, quick, for pig and sheep. I open the door to my east chamber. I sit on my couch in the west room. I take off my wartime gown and put on my old-time clothes. Facing the window, she fixes her cloud-like hair. Hanging up a mirror, she dabs on yellow flower powder. She goes out the door and sees her comrades. Her comrades are amazed and perplexed, traveling together for 12 years. They didn't know Mulan was a girl. And so I like the added detail in this version with outside the wall, because, you know, in certain portrayals, like Chinese houses will have outdoor gate 
like walls and gates. Um, so these people are leaving like the comfort and safety of their own home to like greet their daughter back. Um, in case you didn't know, Rouge is blush, <laughs> face paint. Um, and I do like the comrades rather than comrades at arms, although the comrades at arms kind of also imply a more old timey style, which I enjoy, but you know, it's it's a mix. So I thought was interesting is that Mulana's siblings? Like what? Um there's an elder sister that Mulana's the younger sister of, and then she is the elder sister of the younger brother, because her father does not have any grown sons. They specifically said that in the beginning, not that he doesn't have any. He doesn't have any adult sons. Um, and because if Mulan is an adult to go fight in the war, then she would have to be older than the younger brother. Which I thought was just fascinating. I... I can't... I think in the live action at least she has a sister, but I don't know if they're like older or younger. Uh, I don't... I didn't think in the comic that she had any siblings. Not the comic, the animation. Oh wow, sorry. <laughs> and then of course the yellow flower powder is, uh, sets the second poem in the Tong Dynasty, which after some cursory googling they said it was like a large hallmark of that time. Um, and of course the first poem just calls it bisque makeup, which I guess at that time like rouge and face makeup would be a kind of like sticky, watery substance. I, I mean that makes sense. Uh, so then last we have stanza four. The he hair's feet go hop and skip. The she hair's eyes are muddled and fuddled. Two hairs running side by side close to the ground. How can they tell if I am he or she? Um, and I kind of like this more direct instance of saying, yeah, this is precisely the uh, point I'm trying to make to you, the audience, that you can't tell what gender people are when they're doing the same thing at the same time, uh, and I, I do like that. Um, I also do like the he hairs and she hairs versus the duck and the, the buck and the doe. I do like those more. Um, and I, th again, I think it's fascinating that this poem is such a strong feminist message from like just so long ago. Uh, I, I don't know, I don't, I, I guess I encounter that in works of literature still, but it's fascinating to me and really cool. And so I also think it's interesting that you're able to take just this ballad and like some knowledge of the historical events around the supposed time that this ballad took place and turn them into such a long and such a powerfully impactful movie. And I mean, it's quite clear that Mulan is a Chinese folk hero and has been for such a long time and again i think the main the other interest i have in this is that it's kind of like it's a very uh person-centric uh mulan-centric piece which i also think is interesting just because like it's especially stereotyped that like you know do everything for the good of the group in like eastern countries and like the fact that we have mulan refusing a position from the emperor and not like advancing her family's honor in that way like I think that's fascinating and it's really cool because this ballad really like erases that stereotype too because it's very clear that she's disrespecting her family's wishes and she's disrespecting like working to advance their like power or like whatever and I think it's such a nice just kind of implied that family is more important then, you know, just, oh, saving face and like, oh, we'll just send our husband off to war because that's what the emperor wants us to do. Because I think, I think often now a, a large stereotype that emerges is like, oh, we just do whatever, like, the emperor tells us to do. Or like, oh, we do whatever the ruler tells us to do without, like, a care for what happens because of it. Um, and here it's very clearly not, they don't have that attitude. Um, I do think it's kind of funny though because when I was first reading the poem it was kind of implied that maybe the father and mother were calling after Mulan for leaving. Um, that I interpret it both as either Mulan kind of like being homesick or the father and mother being genuinely distressed by her leaving of course. Um, even though 
she tells them what her plan is. So it's kind of a mix between the two. And I mean, this is translated versions, so like who knows if me going off of word selection means absolutely anything at this point. Uh, I don't know, I think this is such a cool piece with like such a neat message and like, especially if you wanted to share this with like younger kids or like other people who aren't as into poetry, this is something pretty easy to interpret. It's not something that's hard to interpret. I personally think this would be a lot of fun to like even show smaller kids or even you, like it's easy to grasp. Um, the only part that could give a lot of pause is the last stanza, which we're still staring at. And even then, if you talk it over, I think it's pretty clear to see that it's an endorsement of equality, which I think is great. Uh, I don't know. I really, I really did enjoy reading this. I enjoyed kind of frantically Googling things in the middle of the night about it <laughs> for a couple days just because I was working on it kind of sporadically, but it was fun. I had fun reading these things, typing them back out. Uh, I think it's vastly interesting and really cool. Um, and since we are having a talk about China, please, please be aware of what's happening to the Uyghur. Is that how you say it? I feel like I'm saying it correctly, but please correct me if I'm not. The Uyghur Muslims that are being arrested and put into quote-unquote re-education camps. Uh, please remain aware of that. Uh, I, I, I'll try to find some resources and link them to see if we are able to help in any way besides just spreading knowledge that this is happening and trying to bring it to more people's attention because if there was potentially more pressure put then maybe something could happen. Uh, but as it is, it's honestly truly disturbing and quite, quite upsetting. Um, and do not forget that Disney filmed near them and still said it was okay after that. And it's just, it's so problematic. It's so bad. Um, and I didn't really want to make this, this video about Mulan without at least talking about it a little bit. I'm not the most informed, <laughs> honestly, just because it's so depressing to look into. Um, it it truly just drags me into sadness, but even be, even so, more people need to know about it. I will do my best to link resources and how we can help. I haven't seen a lot of solutions for that, so hopefully I'll find some uh, with some googling. But remember, this poem is about equality. This poem is about doing what's best for your family and for you and making sure that the people you love are okay. And I think that's something that we could all get behind. Um, thanks for listening to this. Thanks for watching. If you have any corrections about my pronunciation, please let me know. I'm sorry, I'm bad at pronouncing things. <laughs> uh, if you have any direct knowledge about the Muslim camps in China, any way we can help with that, please let me know. Please leave it in the comments below. That would be amazing. Uh, so thank you everybody for watching. I hope this was an enjoyable experience for you as well, and I'll see you all in the next one. Scholastically Natalie is out.